Alpine Touch has been part of the fabric of Montana for more than 60 years. Decades ago, Russell Street started selling his Touch of Magic in Whitefish. Years later, Alpine Touch's all-purpose seasoning remains a favorite. It's tailgating season, and there's no better way to spice up your grill before a Grizz game than with Alpine Touch. Go to alpinetouch.com now and use the checkout code ESPN10 for a 10% discount on your order. Alpine Touch is here to keep your mouth watering all football season. Alpine Touch, Montana's special spice. Pumps Pump It Up Rewards Plus program and never pay full price for fuel again. Save five cents on every gallon every day at any town pump across Montana. Plus, earn and redeem points on your favorite in-store items to get free stuff with our clubs. Stop in and pick up a rewards card. Download the Pump It Up Rewards Plus app today. Or visit townpump.com slash rewards to register and start saving. question what has all played into this turnaround that the Grizz have seen well thanks for having me first of all Sam uh the I, I was thinking about this over the break because you got a lot of time to think I think that these I think that's going to be a huge factor in this game right what did all that both these teams think about all the, the whole time because you know you could say there's the confidence there's the momentum there's the you know the rest you know there's all these different things there's South Dakota State's winning streak there's Montana's winning streak but one thing I was thinking about was how I think one of the reasons why this Montana team sort of defied our uh, sense of how we th- how we think that we understand modern football is they're such an old school bunch, and part of that is that I, I think that we want teams to be like as good as they're going to be right away, and then like sustain that, and I think that sometimes. Sports just aren't linear. First of all, there's not just automatic constant improvement. Guys don't just get better from freshman through senior year. A lot of times you peak earlier and then you don't you don't have as good of an end of your career. But other times you do. And I think that's where this Montana team is at. Is I, I and Braxton Hill said this on our Big Sky Breakdown podcast a couple weeks ago. He said, Hey, when you guys were all saying that we weren't very good coming out of the NAU game, you guys were right. It's not that you were wrong. You guys were right. We have just gotten way better as the season's gone along. And I think sometimes we think, oh, you need all this star power. You need these transfers. You need all this stuff. You need to be ready made right away. But there is a certain element to a team just massively improving throughout the scope of a season. And I think that's what you got this Montana team. I think part of that's because you look at some of the guys in their lineup, right? Like Trevin Grandy, he'd never started at corner before in his whole life. And he had a couple of picks early, but he he was sort of up and down. Well, then by the second half of the year, he gets his legs under him. He's a first-team all-league guy. Same thing with Jackson Lee. He was backing up Robbie Houck. He hardly got any playing time. Well, now, you know, and then, so he's swimming the first half of the year. He's a Class C kid from Montana. For people that don't know what that means, this guy's played eight-man football. He doesn't even know how to play with 11 guys. Well, then, you know, he starts getting his feet under him, and you can just tell that story across the roster. So I think the short answer is that they have just improved dramatically throughout the season, and that's where Bobby Houck's system is great. When it works, that's how it works. Yeah, and I've I, I've traveled a decent amount. You know, I'm in Minneapolis, and so I can't, you know, drive to different games, you know, every weekend of the year, unfortunately. But, you know, I've been to a decent amount of, of different uh, you know, towns and stadiums and all that. And there are some places where you go and you can drive around town and you don't see a ton of stuff about, you know, that, that, that university, that football team, you have to kind of get closer to campus. But when I was in Missoula a couple of years ago, I mean, everywhere you go, it's, it's Montana athletics, Montana football. So what has the buzz been like around town, not only in, in the, in the several days leading up to this game, but also just throughout the playoffs? Man, and I, as, as somebody, and I, I'm sitting here as we record this in Missoula, Montana. Missoula is my hometown, and we've certainly expanded to cover the whole big sky, but it's, it's certainly the place that I'm the most familiar with having grown up here. And the things about Missoula you got to know are, one, it's a fanatical town when it comes to the Grizzlies. It is, Grizz football is an enormous, enormous deal. You, know, you talk about the 26,500 fans that they average on a Saturday – but there's another 25 or 30,000 people in the town on any given game day that are they're wondering what's going on. Like it dictates the whole town. It's still, it still is largely a college town. And 
you know, most of the 75,000 people that live here are somehow engaged in the game. They're either watching it or uh, they're at it or they're avoiding the crowds because of it. You know, they're going to Costco because they know nobody's going to be there on that particular day. So that's one thing. The other thing is, though, because the Grizz had such an elongated stretch of success, there's also just a lot of uh, manic feelings about the Grizz. And I think that's why you get these huge spikes of people thinking, man, this team is the greatest team ever, or, oh my gosh, these guys are terrible. Let's fire everybody. You know, and, and I, I mean, that's like Bobby Houck says, that's what makes college football great is the fanatics, the people that are just totally crazy about this stuff. And, and that's where all the passion comes from. So, you know, from my seat, I, I would tell you this. I do a lot of sales uh, for both ESPN radio and for Skyline Sports. And I, I will tell you in uh, June, July, and August, it was really hard to sell Grizz football stuff. It was the hardest it had ever been to sell Grizz football in this town. And after the NAU loss, it was like, mm, no, we have this whole plan to sell the second half of the season for my college game day show uh, to a whole bunch of sponsors. And people said, ah, we don't really know what we want to do. Well, then after they beat Sac State, the phone started ringing off the hook. Everybody <laughs> wants it. Everybody wants to spot at college game day. You know, we had to rent a whole separate parking lot so we could have a bigger tailgate. And, you know, so that's just one part of it. But there really is, you know, there's a financial windfall that comes with Grizz football doing well. Anybody that's been to Missoula knows that the vibrant downtown is one of the the the, the treasures of all of the treasure state, honestly. I mean, the, the downtown Missoula is, it's amazing. If you've never been here, please come visit. Please don't buy a house here. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's been cool because it really is a boon. It's a boon financially. It's a boon in positivity. That's the thing is when you have a community that's so obsessed about something like this, you're going to be talking about the Grizz no matter what. It makes the whole positive or negative element of all the conversations you have when they're not doing so well or they just got their butts kicked by the cats. Everybody's down in the dumps because they don't know what to do about all of it. Well, now that they're really, really good, everybody's riding high and uh, seems like the manic nature. It's at uh, it's at a high point right now. So it's been cool for this small town for sure. Have you or a loved one been charged or accused of a crime? If so, the stress can leave anyone feeling helpless and alone. But you don't have to be alone. Hi, I'm Dave Maldonado and I've successfully defended Montanans for over a decade in these situations. So if you're tired of being scared, let's get you prepared. To see how, visit BigSkyDefender.com today. You are not alone. Visit BigSkyDefender.com to find out more on how you can fight back against local and federal criminal charges. Yeah, there, there are so many, you know, X's and O's and on-field stuff that we can, you know, maybe dive into later on. But it, it, it's going to be interesting because you know, kind of the, uh, the mental makeup of these teams leading up to the game where, you know, sometimes you go, you know, this team wanted it more, or this team, this team came out with their hair on fire while the other team was maybe a little more passive or maybe overconfident, whatever the case may be, but I don't, or, or not confident, you know, if you're Montana and the underdog, whatever the case uh, you want to, you want to make it. I don't know if that's going to be the case for either team because I had Matt Zimmer on and, you know, the, the South Dakota, South Dakota state beat writer. And he was talking about, you know, all these upperclassmen for the Jacks have come back for this moment, for this stage. And so it's it's hard to see South Dakota State having an off game. For Montana, I mean, they're led by Montana guys where I know you've talked about it, Coulter, where their football goal growing up wasn't necessarily, I want to make it to the NFL. It's, I want to play for the Grizz. And now they're doing it and they're, they're star players for the Grizz. So can you kind of talk about, you mentioned how big of a deal Montana football is, but for some of these players that grew up in the state that are now the star players, like what aspect of that plays into this game of these guys, you know, a lot of these guys, this will be their last game ever playing football and they're doing it for, you know, a team that they've always dreamed of playing for. Well, I think that's a cool dynamic in both these games or for both these teams in this game, you had a great tweet talking about how there's 16 guys from Montana on the Montana two deep. And there's 16 guys from South Dakota on the South Dakota state two deep. That's awesome. Yeah. And that, that's just on the, that's just on the two deep roster wise. Right. It, it's way more than that. Yeah, totally. I mean, there's, I think there's 55 guys on the roster from Montana, <laughs> yeah. you know, for the university of Montana. So, you know, I mean, I, I know we're talking about two really rural places and um, South Dakota is certainly one of the, the only places in America that can rival Montana in terms of how rural it is. But you got to remember Montana's so big that so many of the communities are just tiny, man. Like you're talking about towns of less than a thousand people or just a couple thousand people. And the cats and the Grizz are the pro teams of Montana for sure. And so you look at Montana's lineup, right? I mean, their linebacker core. You got a walk-on from Anaconda, who, which is one of the great sports towns in the whole state. 
but a tiny little mining town, you know, used to be the place where they smelted all the copper. You know, you got a couple other walk-ons from right here in Missoula, from Missoula Big Sky, a couple of guys that didn't have a position coming out of high school and they just made their way. And they're just, they're the latest in the, this unbelievable string of in-state walk-on linebackers that the Grizz have been able to cultivate. And it's just kind of on down the line. But I think that that's, you know, talking about the confidence of these two teams. I think that's what's so awesome about this matchup. Talking to those South Dakota State guys, I got a chance to talk to Mark Gronowski, Mason McCormick, and Adam Bach, who are three of the captains for SDSU. First of all, what unbelievably mature and disciplined and deliberate young men. I mean, I, mean, I couldn't believe how just steady and articulate they were. The interviews were just excellent. They were awesome. And they talked about that, you know, about how they have an astute understanding of the dynamic that exists right now in college football and how this this whole – the grass is greener and we can get these NIL monies and all this stuff. They said, we don't want any of that. What we want is to have an expectation of excellence from our coaching staff and to win as many football games as we possibly can. And we know if we do those two things, we'll be ingrained in the legacy of our program and we'll have a chance to go to the NFL. And look at them. Most of those guys that is named are probably going to the NFL and they've won 28 straight games. So that's pretty cool. You talk about Montana though. This is a dream come true for these guys, no doubt. But also they have an undeniable swagger. You, you can look at all the statistics and numbers that you want for this Grizz team. Some are impressive, some are not impressive. But as I was talking with Trajan Cotton, one of their captains about, there is no statistic for quantifying the heart of a team. They have such a team. They are such the sum of all of their parts. They only have a couple individual like outstanding elite talents but they have like 50 guys that are all pretty good. And when they all work together, they're exceptionally good. And that gives them then a crazy sense of belief and a crazy sense of confidence. So I think both those things really cater to uh, Montana, even though they are an underdog in the point spread and South Dakota State's won all these games, Montana's going to have a lot of confidence coming into this game. Yeah. And you, you answered my next question there. Cause I was curious about kind of just the mood around Montana, whether, you know, whether, if there was, you know, kind of a quiet confidence or a loud confidence or, uh, you know, maybe the mindset of, hey, we, no one, maybe not even us expected us to be here. Whatever happens in Frisco is kind of gravy for us, but it kind of seems like, and I wouldn't expect any team to have that mindset of, you know, whatever happens, you know, it's whatever we're happy to be at this point, but it, it kind of sounds like Montana in a sense is kind of likes the fact that they're underdogs. If that makes sense, like they're kind of, uh, you know, playing the underdog role uh, so well. And they, there's a quiet confidence about them. That sounds pretty accurate then. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and you know, all these guys are super competitive guys all across college football, all across the FCS, but it was a really weird dynamic being in Moscow a couple weeks ago because that, that's good. That's a good Idaho team. Mm -hmm. They had a great year, make it back to the playoffs for the first time in 30 years. There wasn't like this sense of heartbreak and disappointment. They were certainly disappointed to kind of blow the lead or whatever, but I think they also knew like, hey, we're playing with house money. Being in the quarterfinals year two under a coaching staff is pretty good. I also think that they knew that some of those guys like Javon McCoy, Anthony Woods, Hayden Hatton, that their time there in Idaho was, was probably done. You know, then the following week, you know, you don't want to say you Albany didn't show up to play, but when it was 21-0 in, in, in Brookings, they were ready to tap out. And then when it was 42, nothing, they're like, warm up the plane, man, get us out of here. It was, uh, it was definitely not, you know, you could tell that it was not necessarily just happy to be there, but they didn't have that, that fight in that drive. That's the thing about this Grizz team. That's where so many of the guys coming from Montana and having a coach that's been there for so long comes into play. These guys have got it hammered into their brains since they first got to Montana about the tradition of Montana. You know, guys on this team that are seniors, they were only what, you know, in elementary school, the last time the Grizz were in the national championship game, but it's a part of it. Like the, the, if you've ever been to the Adams Center at the University of Montana, it's this massive hall of fame that's just a, a, a sort of a, an homage to all of the greats of the past. History is such a big part of the university as a whole, and particularly the, the, uh, the football program. So these guys know, these guys know it's about something bigger than them. You've seen all these ex-players come out of the woodwork in recent weeks and, and definitely be, you know, standing on the table about the Grizz. And, and I think that's been a cool part of this whole thing as well. So that's all to say that Montana 
absolutely does not think they're an underdog in this game. Part of that comes from the personality of their head coach. I don't think Bobby Halkus thought he was an underdog for one second in his life. That's just the way, <laughs> that's just the way he's wired. And, you know, he's a bristly guy. Sometimes he's a complete, uh, he's, he's a, com he's completely rude sometimes to the media. But the thing that I will always, always give Coach Out credit for is there is nobody that I've ever come across in my life that understands the expectation of excellence at the University of Montana and embraces it like Bobby Houck. And so I think he's passed that along to his players. So I do think that they are, I wouldn't even say a quietly confident group. They're not going to be brash, but they are certainly absolutely confident going into this game. And I talked with Matt Zimmer about this, um, and I'm still trying to, get the exact numbers but the average age of the South Dakota State coaching staff is going to be in the lower lower 30s uh, I'm pretty sure Wikipedia the average doesn't even know how old Jimmy Rogers is I'm like trying to find <laughs> out how old this guy is he he's asked to be in his mid-30s right I mean he graduated college 2009 that's when I graduated I'm 36 so he's have to he I mean yeah these guys are super young yeah so Matt Matt said that uh coach Rogers is 35 and he's the oldest guy on the staff Right, because I mean, Zach Lujan, the offensive coordinator, I remember covering him when he played because they played the Cats and the Grizz in the playoffs, 14 and 15. Jesse Bobbitt, who's their D.C., he also played there, right? I mean, I think he's got to be in his late 20s or early 30s. So, yeah, I mean, they're incredibly young. It's it's fascinating. Yeah, and you compare that to Montana, who I'm guessing average age is mid-50s, probably, for their average age of their yeah. coaching staff. Yeah, I mean, so, Bobby, Bobby Houck's 59. Uh, they did sort of reduce the average age because because uh, Kent Bear and Derek <laughs> Jacks both retired last year. Those guys were both at the, about to be seventy, so they had had a life of college football. But but still, yeah, no, I mean, I mean, Roddy Bradford's like the young guy on the staff, and and he's forty seven. So so they they certainly have a, a lot of experience under their belts. Yeah, and you know the the saying is it's more about the Jimmys and the Joes rather than the X's and O's. But when you have a three week break. You know, the X's and O's, you know, they, they're, they're pretty important as far as how you game prep for this. So how have you, um, I guess, kind of seen Montana handle this three-week uh, break to prep for this game? Well, that's the other factor is I know South Dakota State has the advantage of having done this before. They've, they've been to Frisco twice in recent years, one in the spring, one in the fall. So, so I do think that's advantage South Dakota State just because they're familiar with the venue and the trip and wh what all that that's going to take. But you look at, you know, Bobby Houck, who – was at UNLV. I know it was not very successful, but they did go to a bowl game there. But before that, before he was the head coach at Montana, uh, you know, he coached for Terry Donahue at UCLA, and then he coached for Rick Neuheisel at both Washington and Colorado. So he had a decade plus of bowl prep under his belt. Brett Pease, same thing. I mean, he's coached at Kentucky, Florida, Baylor, Boise State. He's coached in, you know, a dozen plus bowl games in his career. That's the offensive coordinator for those that don't know. Ronnie Bradford, the DC, you know, he played in the NFL forever, but coached the USC before he came to, to uh, Montana. So you go, you go, go on down the line. They have most of their coaches have been in the FBS. So they have bull prep experience. And I think that's kind of what they're treating this as. It's a, it's such an interesting dynamic though. Right. Cause I mean, to, I'll throw this back to you, Sam, cause South Dakota state, I thought they sort of, sleepwalk is the wrong way to say it, but th they were lackluster until they really put the foot on the gas against Villanova. But then they closed that game out, but you were tweeting about it. You know, a lot of times the favorite sort of muddles through the quarterfinal and then they just slam dunk the semifinal and say, Hey, we're here. We're going, we're going down to Frisco. That's exactly what they did to you Albany, but that game was over at halftime. Yeah. But there was no like riding the roller coaster of emotions with a thrill or anything like that. So I think that's a huge advantage for South Dakota State. They can start thinking and dreaming about Frisco, boom, right away. There's no, like, come down or anything like that. You can just reset. For Montana, I think that's an enormous factor because the win over North Dakota State was, I would say, the single most exciting victory in the history of Washington Grizzly Stadium. I think there's maybe two or three other games that maybe are up there. But, you know, in terms of my time as a journalist, it was the most thrilling game I've ever covered. It was, it was a crazy game. They came all the way down the wire. Well, when you win it, you're like, you feel like you won the Super Bowl, but you didn't. You're just going to the Super Bowl. So how do you reset? So I, I do think, though, I think if Montana would have had to turn around and play the next week, I think they would have got destroyed. I think that I think that the come down from that and the let down from that would have been crazy. But the fact that you got a week to sort of uh, compartmentalize all that, soak it in and start to get ready, then you get a week off, and then you get another week to prepare for an opponent 
I think that helps uh, Montana as well. I do think that the, the letdown of the NDSU game would have been an effect if not for the break, but I think the break helps mitigate that a little bit as well. At Blackfoot Communications, our mission is to connect people, businesses, and communities, bringing a world-class fiber network to homes, communities, and businesses of all sizes, ensures Montanans have access to fast, reliable, and secure internet and phone services. Are you ready for fiber internet? To find out if fiber is coming to your area, visit goblackfoot.com slash ready for fiber. Connect to more with Blackfoot Communications. Yeah, and you've your 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 focus is obviously Montana, Montana State, and also the Big Sky as well. But just naturally through crossover games, you've seen a lot of Missouri Valley Football Conference teams play, especially North Dakota State, uh, especially South Dakota State uh, over the years. When you're when you've seen and watched South Dakota State uh, this year's version of South Dakota State, how does it stack up to some of the past you know top teams from the Valley that you've seen over the years? Really good question because. I think that the low hanging fruit is for people to say that, that South Dakota state has modeled themselves after North Dakota state. And I do think that in certain ways, like in certain identities of what you want your program to be about good in the trenches, really strong on defense. That's true. But I think that they've gone about doing it in a different way. The thing that stood out to me about South Dakota state is They've had like these quote unquote brand name skill players set for the first, ever since they first landed on my radar, probably 11 years ago in the 2013 playoffs, like in terms of like the FCS circles and the conversations and the people we talk to both on and off the air, most people know who South South Coast State's quarterback is, who their running back is, who their, you know, top linebacker is. Part of that's because they have a great sports information department. That's really good at, at getting the information out there and promoting those guys. But part of it's because they just had really good players. Like, could I go through and name all of Weber State? I mean, I probably could. But, like, I could name the South Dakota State guys better than pretty much anybody. And we don't even cover them directly, but we've just covered them secondarily. And it's because they have so many brand-name type guys. And that's why I think this South Dakota State team is so impressive. Because you ask Jimmy Rogers about these guys, and he says, you know, all all due respect to – Chris Oladokun and and Taron Christian and Zach Luhan and all these guys. Mark is the best quarterback we've ever had. All due respect to Zach Zinner and Pierre Strong and all these guys. Isaiah Davis is the best running back in South Dakota State history. Christian Roseboom, awesome. Adam Bach, just as good. You know, and like they have all these historic players. I know part of that's time and place. And, and you know, Jimmy Rogers is a head coach for the first time, so he's pumping up his guys. But that's been the most impressive part is just how they've been able to have reputable, really talented guys at the most important positions, not just the skill guys on the offensive line, on the defensive line, at inside linebacker. They've had some awesome, awesome players. And I think that that's, you know, North Coast State's had some great talent, but it's still about the machine and the culture of North Dakota State more than anything else. South Dakota State is about that culture, but it's also about the dudes. It's about the dudes that are on the field making the plays. So I think from a broad program's perspective, that's where they're at. I also think that the fact that they've known that to, to get to this point, you have to be first and foremost the best team in your conference. They knew that they had to dominate the Missouri Valley first, and if you do that, everything else is going to come your way because this is the best conference in, in the FCS. The biggest guy in the Missouri Valley are the two. Montana sort of used a similar formula in that element. And then the last thing I'd say is it, it, it just goes back to what I just said, but just emphasizing it, the quarterback play. I mean, they've had great quarterback play, and they have had more sort of explosive uh, abilities in the past game than, than in any of the rest of the Missouri Valley teams I've come across. And a part of that, my brother and I always tease that we should rename the Big Sky Breakdown, throw the ball to the damn tight end. <laughs> Who does it better in South Dakota State? Nobody. South Dakota State throws the ball to tight end. That's why they got multiple guys in the NFL. So I, I, that's a that's another huge part of their culture. But I'd say just their ability to throw the ball uh, so consistently and so efficiently has been the thing that's really set them apart. And going back to Montana, the Grizz lost, what, like three or four first-team all-big-sky guys from last year, also guys that were All-Americans. Yep. But, but, but they're better defensively this year. Is that just personnel-wise and them jellied? Is it? schematically uh, how is this year's defense better than last year's defense based off of the guys they lost from last year that's another great question uh, I, I give you a couple factors 
First of all, they have a new defensive coordinator, and while the base of the scheme, it's a 3-3-5 stack that they took from Rocky Long at San Diego State, while, while the, that base is the same, they've added a lot of, of different things. First of all, they are bringing pressure. They blitz their linebackers a ton. They were obsessed with bringing their linebackers right up the gut, right up the middle. Double A gap blitz is what they call it. Part of that's because guys like Dante Olson and Jace Lewis were just ridiculously good at that. Marcus Weldell, too. Well, uh, the personnel is a little bit different now. Their inside linebackers aren't necessarily as good at blitzing up the gut. They're way better at roaming sideline to sideline and making tackles in space. That's the second adjustment they made, though. Even though it's a 3 3 5, they were basically playing like a 4 2 5, and the third linebacker in the run fit was the strong safety. That's Robbie Houck. That's why he had 450-something tackles because he was the guy that was responsible for running the alley, making the tackle. That was a huge strength of his, but it also came with having a weakness in, in coverage, not even necessarily because of his physical abilities, more than just because he was always coming downhill, and so sometimes you could just hit him over the top. So they changed that in the run fit. They defined their three safety positions way more instead of having all three guys roll through all three they have like defined nickel free safety and strong safety spots and then they've just cultivated so much more depth as well and so you know even though they got they lost patrick o'connell who was a buck buchanan finalist who's now playing for the seahawks and they lost justin ford who you know a lot of people think should be a pro and, and was a borderline pro for sure at corner and robbie Houck, the all-time league tackler and big sky conference play they have it's been addition by subtraction because they're just a much deeper unit and then the other thing i'd give you is Ronnie Bradford, the new defensive coordinator, combined with Tim Houck, the defensive analyst, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find guys with more football savvy and football acumen that are designing defenses in the FCS. I mean, Ronnie Bradford played in the NFL for 12 years, and he he will be an NFL defensive coordinator someday. This is just his first job you know, since, since he got into the college ranks as a play caller. But I, I truly believe he'll be an NFL DC someday. And then Tim Houck played in the NFL for 13 years, and he has already been an NFL play caller. And, and you know, he's got a Super Bowl ring. He was a secondary coach for the Eagles when they won it a couple of years ago. So uh, that level of experience and uh, coaching, I think, has been a huge influence on the Grizz defense as well. Mm-hmm. And those are just kind of small things. Like when you can have, we can, when you can staff, not even, they're not even necessarily assistant coaches, they're just analysts. When you can staff guys like that, if you're Montana, when I talk about, you know, uh, funding your football program at a high level and having the resources in place. Those are some of the things that I mean, you know, having that level of coach on, on your roster, just having an analyst guy who just, all right, watch the film and, and you know, give us some of the X's and O's and, and some of the tips and, and tricks of, of how we can attack uh, other teams. Well, that that's the other advantage of, of Missoula is right. You, yeah. There's the resources, there's the money. Tim Houck wants to live in Missoula because he loves to fly fish. I mean, it's, just, <laughs> it's, it's as simple as like Tim Houck's willing to take an analyst job to work for his brother because he wants to go fishing and hunting, you know? I mean, and that's a pretty good gig. And it's the same thing with like Tim Rosabai and, you know, some of these other coaches. So um, th- there's a huge draw there as well. I mean, we talked about the pride that the Montana guys have in the program that are players. That's also pretty similar on the coaching staff, right? Bobby Houck is a Grizz alum. Tim Houck's a Grizz alum. Brent Pease played at Montana. You know, you can go on down the line uh, and they all have Montana ties in some form or fashion, either from previous stints as coaches or players or both. So I think there's a, it's more than just the the money and the resources. There's a lot about the lifestyle and uh, just getting to live in Missoula that really uh, caters to having great coaches here as well. Mm-hmm. So quarterback uh, Clifton McDowell, he's, you know, after he took over the QB one role, you know, he was just, his trajectory was going up, you know, every week he was getting better and better every week, but two of his worst games were in the quarterfinals and, and the semifinals. What have you seen that has led to that? Is it just simply as, Hey, he faced two good defenses in Furman and North Dakota state, or is there something else that has kind of seen his play plateau as far as the last two games? It's a great question. Um, First of all, the moment that Eli Gilman won the Jerry Rice Award was the moment that everybody that was playing the Grizz decided, hey, we're not letting number 10 beat us anymore. I mean, they've just been loading up on this kid, and he's had hardly any uh, room to breathe. It has nothing to do with him. It's it's simply because that he's, you know, teams have just been throwing the kitchen sink at him. So I think a little bit being more limited in the run game has, has uh, been part of it. 
I also think what you said, I mean, North Coast State's really good on defense. I thought Furman was outstanding on defense. I thought they're excellent. I, I totally underestimated how talented and uh, powerful they were going to be defensively. So um, that's part of it. And, uh, you know, I also think there's just like an acclimation point there too. I mean, it hasn't, it's, a, it's actually been a, a uh, pretty mild winter. I mean, what am I saying? Pretty mild. It's been incredibly mild. It hasn't, <laughs> even, hasn't even been below freezing yet for any of these playoff games. There was like the flurry of snow against Delaware that made a bunch of, of the pictures, but it was not that cold that day. And the snow only was going for 15 minutes, but still, I mean, the guy's from Houston, Texas, and he played all his college ball before he got here in the South. So he, he Clifton McDowell never really played even in the temperatures in the 30s and 40s, you know? So I think there's an acclimation point there. And I think the teams know that Montana, what they do offensively is not anything crazy. But Clifton McDowell's ability to take advantage of opportunities and gash you with big plays in the pass game with their explosive receivers is the way that the Grizz have got ahead on teams. And I think teams now are like, well – at first, teams were like, we're going to just play man on the outside. We're going to dare this guy to beat us. Well, then he hit touchdown bombs against um, Idaho, Sac State, and that, those those plays basically turned the game for them. And so now teams are realizing, okay, well, maybe we should make this guy read some coverages, and, and I think that's been happening as well. So I think it's just kind of the evolution of a season. Have you or a loved one been charged or accused of a crime? If so, the stress can leave anyone feeling helpless and alone. But you don't have to be alone. Hi, I'm Dave Maldonado, and I've successfully defended Montanans for over a decade in these situations. So if you're tired of being scared, let's get you prepared. To see how, visit BigSkyDefender.com today. You are not alone. Visit BigSkyDefender.com to find out more on how you can fight back against local and federal criminal charges. And I'm going to kind of wrap these two questions into one because I, I want to hear you talk about a Junior Bergen and just how electrifying he is. But my question is, you know, what are the... What does Montana have to do uh, to beat South Dakota State uh, on Sunday? And how big of a role does Junior Bergen obviously have to play in that? Man, so Marty Mornoweg, a uh, guy who spent 25 years in the NFL, he's one of my radio partners at ESPN. And, like, he keeps saying, he keeps saying, I know that these coaches are sitting there watching the film and they're like, okay, here's this Bergen kid. Here's what he's doing in the punt return. But our coverage teams are better than the teams we're watching on film. It's not true. <laughs> Your coverage team is not better. And that's nothing against anybody's coverage teams. North Dakota State has a great punter. They were angle punting. They had a whole plan. They executed it perfectly. Junior Bergen still took a punt 55 yards for a touchdown. He's just absolutely lightning in a bottle. So I don't know what you do to mitigate that. But in terms of what Montana has to stay to do to stay in the game, absolutely. They got to pack the, the special teams. They got to pack the defense. They're going to have to play lights out on defense, which I think that they're fully ready and prepared to do. They got to play great on special teams. I think it comes down to more than in the return game. Cause I do think Jimmy Rogers and those guys will have a great plan for that. I think it comes down to, can you make a play? Otherwise, can you block a kick? Can you block a punt? Can you alter the field position? That's the whole way Montana wants to play. Make a big play, seize the momentum avalanche. You. That's their whole game plan across the board. And they, the thing that bo boosts the momentum more than anything is the special team. So yeah, I don't expect South Dakota state to make any turnovers, but I don't think Montana will either. Right. Like these two teams take care of the ball so well, even though they both take the ball away so well. So I think that's sort of a, uh, you know, a draw. I think the defenses are both going to play great. So I think it comes down to two factors. Can the Grizz make big plays somewhere in the world, particularly in special teams and can Clifton McDowell rise his level to at least be sort of comparable to Mark Gronowski. Gronowski is the best quarterback in the country, in my opinion, can McDowell at least sort of make that an even playing field? He's not going to come out and be Gronowski. I mean, Gronowski's passer rating is like 190 or something crazy, right? Like he's I mean, McDowell's not going to do that, but can he like at least make that as sort of an even battle or at least even it out a little bit? I think that's the other factor. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a few more minutes. Any any other thoughts or questions or, or anything that, that comes to mind for you as, as far as this matchup? Well, back to the Junior Bergen thing. Uh, God, I was getting killed on Twitter for this because during the college football playoff, the Michigan-Alabama game, nobody could catch a punt. Like, what's going on? <laughs> These guys can't catch punts. So I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, well, and then I put it on Twitter. Sometimes you shouldn't put everything you think on Twitter. But I was like, this is why Junior Bergen is going to have an opportunity to go wherever he wants because he can catch. Not only can he catch the punt, he can do electrifying things with it. That said, I don't want to be, you know, the guy that's projecting, oh, this might be this guy's last game at Montana or whatever. 
The kid's absolutely special. It, it's so far beyond the numbers. I mean, he has 55 catches for 700 or something yards, five touchdowns this year. That's, but it's the pl- when he makes the plays and how he makes the plays that are so ridiculous, right? He's he's not getting fed the force fed the ball hardly at all on offense, but when he does, he's just lightning in a bottle. So I think he's going to be a huge X factor as well. And then you know the other thing is, it obviously always in football it comes down to the fronts, but South Coast State's offensive line has gotten so much love, and justifiably so. They are an awesome unit. They're dominant. They have, I think they got two NFL guys up there. So, you know, that's, and I think they're really well coached too. That said, the Grizz defensive line gets no love besides Alex Gubner. The other guys are basically just sacrificial lambs. You know, they're just crashing around, bringing stuff up for the linebackers. But can Gubner dominate his matchup, and how does that influence the way that the Grizz defense can play because Gubner is a special player. I think he's one of the best players in the country. I think he should be a finalist for the Buchanan Award. The stats are never going to bear it out because he's a true nose guard. He lines up in the zero gap. He's only got like 35 tackles. But he completely erases part of the formation every single time, depending on which way he can manhandle his guy. So how's that matchup play out? And then, you know, when you're talking about the tail of the tape, I think South Dakota State has advantages across the board. they got better quarterback. they got better running back, better offensive line. they got – all, you know, great tight end play. They got all this different stuff. They got all this momentum. The one place I think the Grizz do have an athletic advantage is on the perimeter when the Grizz have the ball. And that's, and I actually think they'll be able to match up fine on the perimeter when South Dakota State has the ball as well. Montana's corners are really good and their safeties can run as well. But I think that when the Grizz have the ball, Keelan White, Junior Bergen, and Aaron Fonts are going to have speed advantages over the guys guarding them. That's nothing against the South Dakota State DBs. Those three guys are just FBS caliber talents that are they're just they're short. That's why they're in the FCS. But they have they have major juice and they're really explosive. So can the Grizz figure out a way to get those guys in space and maximize th- that advantage? I think that's going to be huge as well. What do you think? I mean, I think that there's so many like intangible factors that we usually weigh in this, but in terms of teams showing up and playing hard and being ready for the moment, I think that's a complete draw. What do you think? I think, I think it is a draw because uh, I think both teams are going to be so motivated coming in. I do think, you know, obviously a fast start is, is kind of easy to say, but I think a fast start for Montana is key because I've been to, this will be my 11th year uh, going to an FCS title game. And I've seen teams that are not experienced in Frisco play teams that are experienced in Frisco. And some sometimes those teams that are not experienced that, you know, they, it's kind of a whirlwind for them. And by the time they wake up, the game's already over. I mean, shoot Jacksonville state, when they played North Dakota state in the mid 2010s, their players, some of their players missed the team run out because they were too busy talking trash to NDSU players. And so by the time, you know, they ran out on the field, they're a little bit late. They, they kind of they didn't really realize they're in the national title game until the start of the second quarter, when they kind of started making some moves, it was already 21, nothing. And I'm not saying Montana is going to be like that, but I just think a fast start for Montana is going to be key because if all of a sudden you fall behind 10, nothing, 14 nothing and South Dakota state has the ball for eight minutes to your two minutes. All of a sudden that doubt starts to creep in, you know, all that momentum kind of starts to falter. Uh, so I just think just having, having that fast start from Montana landing a couple of punches early is going to be huge. And I think the first eight minutes of this game is really going to dictate how this game goes, whether it's going to be close or whether South Dakota state is kind of just going to kind of slowly roll to a decisive win here. I agree. The Grizz have a really hard time playing from behind. Uh, uh, that's not a knock on them. That's just the style they play. That's Bobby Ball. That's what Bobby Alk wants yeah. to do. He wants to get up on you, and then he wants to swing the momentum and just absolutely destroy you. And that's why you see the Grizz Avalanche teams. You know, you, you might look at the scores and be like, "How does this team win games by forty points when they only average three hundred and fifty yards per game?" It's because <laughs> when the momentum gets out of control, they only play on half the field because they can just dominate you in the field position game. So, last question for you. Then I know we only got a minute left. How South Dakota State's punter? That's the only thing I don't have a gauge on because Montana's punter is really good. Travis Benham's been lights out. How South Dakota State's punter? Yeah, so Hunter Dustman, he does everything for South Dakota State, punts, kicks. Um, and so he's got a big leg on him. It sounds like, you know, talking to Matt Zimmer, it sounds like South Dakota State plans on punting to Junior Bergen. They're going to try to angle it. I, I mean, like you said, NDSU did everything right on that one punt return. You know, he, he was just uh, that good. And so um, I think Junior Bergen is going to have a chance here to, to make some plays because I, I do think he's going to – I mean, Montana has to force some punts first, but and I think they will. But I think Junior Bergen is going to get the ball in his hands on some punts. Well, have fun for me down there, man. I'm jealous that I'm not going to be there, but it should be a good one. And thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you, Coulter. I appreciate it.
Join Town Pump's Pump It Up Rewards Plus program and never pay full price for fuel again. Save five cents on every gallon every day at any town pump across Montana. Plus, earn and redeem points on your favorite in-store items to get free stuff with our clubs. Stop in and pick up a rewards card. Download the Pump It Up Rewards Plus app today. Or visit townpump.com slash rewards to register and start saving. Town.